So what do you do when you get out of the military? We talk about that all the time on this show. How do our brave men and women who are transitioning out and in the last five years and years to come, the numbers have been about a 275,000 active duty become veterans every year. Well, if you do the numbers from World War II, when the baby boomers came out after fighting the great fight from the greatest generation ever, 25% of those became entrepreneurs. Now we're living in the same day and age where people want to create businesses. So what you have to ask yourself is, how do you transition out? Well, we're gonna talk about this subject <laughs> some other fun ones to tie in some current events, but we're gonna talk about veterans and transitioning and, and what it means and break it down Gumby style for the folks who actually have no idea what our veterans, our men and women in uniform, go through when they leave the military. Find out this and a lot more coming up next. <laughs> good show for you and yes I know I say that every episode well dang it it's true we have good shows every day so today's guest I'm pumped this is my dude like one of my favorites of course it's marine so I always say one of my favorites but we're gonna be talking a little bit everything we're gonna start off we're gonna we're gonna hit up transition we're gonna talk about what that means a lot of you message me go I don't understand this veteran transition that you guys talk about what is the struggle or the big deal we're gonna talk about it and we're gonna talk about what veterans are doing in service out of uniform it's pretty amazing how many veteran organizations and brands have been created post 9-11. After our brave men and women take off their uniforms, they usually are creating amazing businesses. Uh, the list goes on and on. One of the biggest names, and you've heard me talk about it here, Black Rifle Coffee, Nine Line Apparel. Brands before those brands, pre 9-11 brands like FedEx and GoDaddy, both created by Vietnam veterans and Marines. So we have all these amazing businesses and we're gonna learn more about them. Obviously, we're, gonna, we're also going to talk about how humans consume content and what it means for your brand, whether it be personal or your business. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about law enforcement and what's going on in the world with everybody running around saying they want to defund the police. Uh, as we've seen in the news recently, even the amazing SWAT team that found the Boston bomber, they defunded that program. Now, we all agree that some law enforcement officers are bad, just like some people are bad. We have prisons full of bad people. Just like in the military and firefighting and anywhere, even probably at your job, you have turds, crappy human beings. They're everywhere. Does this mean you need to shut down your local target if you meet a bad employee? Nope, that's not what it means. And our cops are overtaxed, overused, and have to do everything from marriage counseling to talking people off jumping off bridges. This isn't the normal job where you're stopping criminals. So we're gonna talk about that today. So I'm excited to get to the point with my good friend and United States Marine Corps veteran, Stephen Kahn. <laughs> Steve, how you doing today, bud? I'm doing fantastic, Eric. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Oh, awesome. I, I love it when I come in with tons of energy and my guests are like, what's up, man? How you doing? Every one of you, I don't know why. I, just, <laughs> I think I drink too much coffee. That's what uh, my team will tell you is Eric consumes a lot of coffee. I think that's why my social media talks about it so much. I'm always obsessed about starting your morning with coffee. Uh, it's one of those things that I love. Are you a coffee drinker? I am. I, I actually am a coffee drinker, but based off of Based off of your observation and my lack of energy, I think 
I think I might up my coffee intake tomorrow. But uh, just to be real clear, I live in the great country of Texas right now, and uh, there is a, a very scary, uh, almost you know, very difficult to digest coffee company that exists here in Texas. Uh, they actually started, I think, in Utah, Black Rifle, mm. and oh, I mean, ooh, ooh, scary, 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 scary rifle. But I, I, that's the coffee I drink. I am a very proud nice. member of their coffee club. Mm-hmm. Um, they do, a, they do some fantastic work. Veteran owned, obviously, veteran supported, uh, and they, they are, quite frankly, a video production company that happens to be touting one particular product. Then they've done a damn good job of doing it. So, they do. I, I uh, we actually in the that's opening. What I'm proud of, like, yeah. We, we gave an opening monologue. I mentioned Black Rifle Coffee. They are constantly mentioned on the show. We get our coffee from them and also Seabag Coffee, uh, which is just north of us with a Marine recon. And it ha- I think the whole reason why I work with him is purely because he's a Marine. It has nothing to do with disrespect to the boys at Black Rifle. I love their coffee. I talk about their coffee quite often, and I'm, it's great. I just saw that they opened another location in San Antonio, like a physical brick and mortar drive through which is great. It's great. Those guys are amazing. If you think Matt Best, JT, and Evan have really built an amazing company and their current leadership is simply just <laughs> for a company that was known for video, they make really good coffee. So, and, and they're great vets. Couldn't agree more. And, and, and that trans- Tom Davin. Yeah. That, and that transitions great into this, Steve. You are the founder and CEO of Knucklehead Media Group. Uh, you are a prior service United States Marine Corps veteran. That sounds a mouthful to say it. But you, just like we're talking about Black Rifle Coffee, uh, Nine Line, and so many amazing other brands that are out there, you're absolutely killing it. And a lot of these brands are built by post-9-11 veterans. For those of you who are not in the veteran community, we talk about post and pre-9-11. I don't know why, but we created it because we had such after, of course, just after Pearl Harbor, we had that major enlistment because we went to war. Same thing happened after 9-11. So when you hear on our show, we talk about pre and post. It's simply dignifying when you served and kind of going. And we've seen a huge surge in you post 9-11 veterans coming out and absolutely building businesses that are successful. You're one of them. I see you everywhere. It started now. So what came first? (laughs) Not the chicken or the egg, but was it the knucklehead podcast, which I absolutely love because you're one of the only guys I know that gets on there and it's like, dude, tell me about your failure. I remember when you interviewed me and that was your question. Tell me about when you failed. And I'm like, wow. You want to go there on a podcast. It's not going to be fluffy and sunshines and kitty cats. So what came first? Was it Knucklehead Podcast or your media group? That's a really good question. It's a really good question. Eric, well, uh, first of all, I, I appreciate uh, the the topic of business ownership as it relates to you know military entrepreneurs, uh, veteran entrepreneurs. Um, and it's not unique to just veterans. I mean, there's there's people who believe here in the United States uh, that the values and morals that we represent uh, as a country uh, are worth fighting for. They're worth fighting on the front lines of capitalism day in and day out. They're worth uh, losing some sleep over. They're worth explaining those hard, really kind of principles and values to, to pass on to the next generation. I think one of the greatest presidents in the history of this country, Ronald Reagan, said, that, uh, and we're not getting political here, we're just simply talking about values. Uh, so from a value standpoint, he said that we're only one generation away from losing our freedom. Uh, and if you look at the majority of, of veterans who served or people who are uh, you know, sympathetic or empathetic uh, towards the causes of liberty and freedom, those line up and those dovetail really nicely with individual responsibility. Individual responsibility, uh, everybody has an opportunity to, to leverage the 24 hours that God gave you day in and day out uh, to maximize a return on each one of those hours. Uh, but we, we see it more as a civic responsibility to take each one of those little segments of time and, and, and squeeze as much as you can out of them, um, which is why, you know, whenever I was running a, a sales team, I was, a, I was in the ag tech startup world, uh, as was every ambitious young salesman living in the Austin area in the mid 2000s after I separated from the Marine Corps. And uh, when I say that, we're, anybody who's you know near the Austin area is, if you don't own technology, you work at a technology company, um, it, it's, it's a little odd. It, that's just what is known in the Austin area. And specifically, we had, uh, uh, we had started doing some, uh, some work with, with people who didn't believe the same way that, uh, that I did. And um, it led to a confrontation. So HR at the company that I was running and me managing and building a sales team, I always, I'm always out there getting no's, getting kicked in the teeth, uh, leading and managing my, my sales team, helping them navigate what they get out there. Where HR, you know, they, they kind of 
play nicely together and they want everybody to sing Kumbaya, much to your point about most podcasters. Uh, that wasn't the way that you go out and, and create revenue or go out there and, and, and mix it up. You can't change an entire marketplace or create market demand if you're just willing to play nice all the time. So with that being said, uh, I had a little run in where we didn't see it eye to eye and she wasn't being honest with one of the guys that I work with. So I honestly, when I confronted her about it, I texted my wife exactly how I felt uh, about what she was doing. It, it turns out though, uh, I did go to the Marine Corps because I'm a knuckle dragger, a little bit of a crayon eater. I actually was sending that text instead of to my wife, who I thought I was sending it to, I was sending it to the HR director, exactly. So <laughs> that's what led to Knucklehead Podcast. Uh, I call that a knucklehead moment. Yeah. And uh, you know, for those of you who are listening to it, just kind of bracing for impact, it's much worse to live through it, but it is fun to listen to. So, yeah, <laughs> so with that being said, uh, we found that there's a lot of business owners who, who want to share those difficult to share stories because they're hard to talk about, but those are where the biggest lessons in leadership and the biggest lessons in business come from. So we started building Knucklehead Podcast at that time, and we found over the course of about 40 to 50 episodes uh, that there was a lot of business owners that actually wanted us to help them not only create social media content, not only create podcasts, but literally build this humanized digital experience for their entire brand, for their entire business. And so that's what we do now. We That's what we do. That's where Knucklehead Media Group came from. And uh, by the time that you were coming on there, if those who actually want to listen, you can go to any anywhere where you listen to podcasts and you can go to, I believe it's episode 31 or 32, where Eric Mitchell uh, comes in and he talks uh, a lot about some of the things that he screwed up in, you know, in the rough streets of, of, uh, of Stockton, California, back whenever he was cutting his teeth in the, you know, in the tech world. So Oh, that's good. That, that's good insight because I was always curious. Where, what, what came first? Not the chicken or the egg, but Knucklehead Podcast. And that's a great story. Wow. A uh, good way to send that text to the wrong person. I think we've all done that sometime in our life. Never to HR. You do take the cake. I can't say that I've done that, but that's a great story. I like that. And a little bit of history about you, which you, I love that you don't share, but you, before you were a Marine, you you, you played football. You are uh, actually a college at Division One football player at that you were the field goal kicker, place kicker for the mighty Nebraska Cornhuskers. Am I correct? Uh, I was certainly on the team. Okay. I was okay. certainly on the team. My roommate, my freshman year, uh, was a much better kicker than I was. I would I would say that he was was the kicker. Uh, he was a punter. He's actually still the punter for the Baltimore Ravens, uh, Sam Cook. And uh, yeah, I, I I did. I was on the football team my freshman year. Right. I walked on. That's huge, Proudly, brother, to be a walk-on. I mean, we've watched Rudy, so I, I'm going to give you props mm -hmm. on that. That's an incredible thing to be able just to walk on. I mean, it's it's not like you walk on, like, the local community college team. You're talking about the Nebraska Cornhuskers, like, one of the premium 25 years ago. teams out there. Yeah, 25 years ago, they they were just going into their third out of the last four or five years national championship. So at the time, they were, they were one of the best, and... We did play in the national championship game. We happened to run into the brick wall that was Miami at the time. Miami with Ken Dorsey and Jonathan Vilma and Ed Reed and, you know, Clinton Portis. And I mean, it was just, that team was just absolute. I think they went on to have like 11 first round draft picks the next year. It was unbelievable. But anyway, long story short, yes, I digress. I, I appreciate you noticing that. You and your team do your homework. Thank you, Eric. I don't mention it all the time just because, you know, I, I love football and I love the competitiveness of it. Uh, but it's it's not what I'm doing right now. No. You know, my boys are starting to develop their interest in sports, which is f fantastic. So I love uh, the X's and O's and the cerebralness of it. Um, and both of my brothers actually were scholarship athletes at Texas A&M. So I was just a young kid wanting to chase after my brother's coattails. That's all. I love it. And then you went and joined the Marine Corps. And look at you today, man. You are uh, you're killing it. So let, let's talk about business entrepreneurship, uh, veteran entrepreneurship okay. specifically. Because sure. I mean, we could talk yeah. about... We have all the big entrepreneurs on our show, and we talk about civilian world, but I love to give kudos, and this is Military Monday. So to me, this is the most important. I want folks to understand that's like you and what you're doing. So obviously, you have Knucklehead Media Group, and it's killing it. And you have amazing partners that work in your company, and these are some of the most talented writers, designers. I mean, just absolutely amazing company. So when people are thinking about working with veterans over a civilian company, and I'm not looking to be like, which one's better? But a lot of people, especially in 2020, we want to support small business. And everybody, doesn't matter what side you lean on, whether you're left or right, everyone, okay, except Antifa, loves veterans. 
Like, you gotta love us. I mean, come on, look at us. I mean, we're pretty. No, just kidding. We're, we're not all pretty. We all can't look like Steven. But for the most part, people would prefer to work with a veteran brand. Why do you think veteran brands are so catchy to work with? And why do you think there's so many amazing veteran companies out there? There's so many. It's not like it was 10 years ago. You could go to Dane, you could find companies like yours that you're like, hell yeah, you cover everything I want. I can get my website done, social media. You know, I can I can build a podcast working with you. Uh, we already mentioned a great coffee company and there's like two or three of those that are pretty good. Why do you think veterans are doing so well in building their own businesses? It's a really good question. It's a really good question. And the, the reason why I'm, I'm I want to highlight veteran businesses is, uh, I, I touched on it just a little bit earlier. Uh, it's important for me to understand that I'm only as relevant to my kids and influence my kids as much as I'm doing today. I know that their, their buddies uh, and their, uh, their generation are going to influence them significantly more, right? And so uh, the, the cause of capitalism, essentially the, the one underlying economic system that, is, that has caused uh, poverty, the, essentially, if you look at just the, the economics of it, the statistics behind um, the economic system, specifically when you look at capitalism, what it's been able to do to pull more people up out of poverty, to create more opportunity, and to provide more economic stability, it's, it's predicated on being able to take risk, calculated risk, and then being able to follow up and follow through with a product or service, or if you're in the distribution business, product, service, or distribution, uh, to go out there and and provide value to a customer base. And exactly for what dollar amount they want to pay you for, I mean, obviously you can have a predetermined set of prices, which is fine, but that's the great thing about uh, that's the great thing about capitalism. That's what I love about it. And even in countries who don't necessarily have that system, they have a they have that form of barter and trade that takes place. And I believe that in the transactional type world, that even as you're build, building relationships, Eric, to, to answer your point, the reason why Americans believe so heavily in uh, and trust uh, veteran businesses is because we, I mean, we did give our our time. You know, we did sign a contract, but that's a, that was a transaction in itself. Um, we take those things seriously. Our, your word means something. You're, you know, if you're going to give somebody your word or you sign a contract, that you're going to be able to follow up and follow through. Um, I, I do believe that that's if they trust the military, they being the American public, then they're going to trust us to be able to uh, to execute on the business side. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's always true, uh, but it does mean that uh, that we're going to give a, pretty much everything that we've gotten, um, our reputation, our time, our energy, our resources and the people that we do business with to try to execute uh, for whatever contracts we enter into. I, I love your response to that because that, that's a great answer. I mean, and it's, there's so many amazing veteran companies out there and I love showcasing them as often as I can. And sometimes we, we blow our own rules and we talk about, we have multiple days where we focus on veterans. We just did this the other day. We had the amazing Jazz Booth from Final Salute Inc. on our show. And the following day we put the amazing Marine Corps veteran Michael Penny on our show to talk about five paragraph order, which I think is a very unique system and a lot more businesses should use it because obviously it works. Uh, you've seen Team of Teams, Stanley McChrystal has his own format that I know a lot Absolutely. of vet businesses swear by his book. I swear by his book too. Not that we run our, we kind of run our business, a disgusting blender of five paragraph and Stanley and some, and some tech stuff crammed into there and go, okay, this is what we call it. But you develop your business on your own. So let me ask you, when you started your business, what sure. are, and I love doing this with business owners like you that are I consider successful. Uh, what are some tips that you give to folks? We're in 2020 and it's been a dumpster fire and we're not gonna get political here at all, but for folks that are building businesses, going through a tough time, for a lot of people, 2020 is literally, you could have a business going for three years, four years. And for some people, it took them back to starting block one, right? Your company could be making $10 million. We've interviewed veterans on the show. $10 million in revenue and lose that revenue stream in less than three months. You are making steady money and all of a sudden it's gone. What advice are you giving to other entrepreneurs? Because I know that you talk to a lot of veterans out there. What advice are you giving to those guys to keep their head up and not just like give in to this hand in, head in the sand mentality that unfortunately so many people are doing? Well, I, I really appreciate that question. Uh, if you rewind the clock back several years ago, um, and I told the story just a few minutes ago about me texting uh, the HR director and, and compromising essentially 
a six figure income stream that I was providing for my family at the time. Um, I, I've been there and it wasn't just COVID related. I've been there to where you look at, um, your income being a certain dollar amount. And then all of a sudden the next day there's, there is no income there. Uh, there's a responsibility that you have if you're a family man to be able to communicate and articulate that to your partner. Right. Um, and in 20, 2020, I, I, I believe that one of the, one of the things that we struggle with the most is communication. Uh, one, just because we're talking at each other instead of talking with each other. And certainly whenever you start talking about uh, friction or you interject uh, a lot of emotions or, or uh, embarrassment or pride or a lot of the emotions that come with uh, essentially bad decisions or um, short-term decisions, decision-making, uh, fear-based decisions, uh, you can't really think critically. So. Um, it's always important in my opinion to go and communicate with business owners that have been in business for a little bit longer because they've, they've seen some storms come through. They understand, uh, how the media works, uh, how they can snowball, uh, emotions into making things a much bigger deal than they are and influence policy. Uh, and then that policy subsequently can come back and impact your business. Um, and honestly, we lost 60% of our revenue at Knucklehead Media Group in, in, in April. So it's not as if I'm insulated, even though we in the digital media space, we're, we're doing fine. However, there's been a significant impact to our business. And so uh, one of the guys who I talk with most of, most of the time, they force me to stop and think about, do you have a crisis communication strategy? If you don't have a crisis communication strategy and you're, you're trying to think uh, what's around the corner, then what you're doing is you're, you're you're already going backwards and there's really only two positions that you can be in in today's world. You're either growing or you're dying. And so if you're not moving forward, then you are in fact dying. However, you you know better than I do, Eric. I mean, you're an infantry guy. Uh, you, you can stop, stop the bleeding yep. and you can start the healing process immediately with what you do. It's true. Yeah. I, and I agree with you. I mean, it, it's, so many things, and it's good. I love another guest who's being honest about losing business. So many times uh, it's frustrating to interview people, not on our show, but to see interviews, especially on national TV, something I deal with on a daily basis. And people are just like, everything's great. And it's like, are you sure? I'm like, we had a struggling April. I mean, it was hard. I mean, it was a whole new world. Now our business has recovered because we did something, and I, 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 it's my next question for you, so I'll kind of lead with what we did and see if you did it. But one thing, uh, George Bryant, who's on our show a lot, the, you know, the light, George Lighthouse Bryant, a great United States Marine fellow brother of ours, talks about being able to pivot quickly or adapt and overcome, something all three of us, that's kind of in our blood, right? So we did yeah. that. That was, uh, we saw it coming, like the tidal wave that you were kind of like, it's kind of like watching the tsunami on YouTube that hit Japan years ago and you were like, you know it's coming, but you're like, is it coming? And you're like, why are so many people standing around? Because you just don't know. And COVID kind of crept up on us because most of us started the year off going, 2020 was great. I mean, I know for our business, it was the best start of a year ever for us. We were just killing it. We were traveling. We were able to go to New York. Our clients were just crushing it. And then March hit and it was like a tsunami hit us. And it was like, how quickly could you outrun it? And yeah, you're going to get clipped in the legs, but prepare for what was going to come. We knew bad was going to come. We knew April was... We knew clients were going to be like, Eric, look where we're at. How did you guys pivot? And you don't have to tell numbers or anything like that unless you want to. But how did you make a pivot to keep your business going? Because I'm bringing this up with that survey released just a few short weeks ago by our friends at Yelp, where Yelp looked at their numbers. 60% of businesses on Yelp were closed permanently. So we're doing good, brother, that we're still talking and we're talking about our businesses. So we should hold our heads up there that we did something right. My question to you is, how did you pivot and what was that like with talking to your team about, okay, guys and gals, how are we doing this? How are we going to make this pivot so we keep our head above water and can still accomplish the mission for your clients? Well, that's a good question. The, the Congress just interviewed a lot of the big tech uh, companies on, on Capitol Hill not too long ago, and they started, and it was painful to watch some of the lines of, line of questioning that takes place uh, there. And when I say painful to watch, I didn't watch all of it. I, I was like most everybody else where I watched a few snippets, uh, you know, that came across my Twitter feed. Um, and it's, it's developing context. Uh, there's a gentleman, a veteran business owner who runs a, a management consulting business called Echelon Front. 
His name's Jocko Willenick and Leif Baven. They co-founded that business together. And we've had a few of their Navy SEALs, uh, the Navy SEALs brethren that they, uh, that they employ. Uh, some of them are not necessarily all Navy SEALs. One of them in particular, Dave Burke, uh, who's going to be coming on Knucklehead Podcast here in, at the beginning of September. Specifically, what they talk about is they talk about uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. It's the OODA loop thought process, right? It's, it was essentially a, a philosophy that was, uh, you know, a 1950s US, a U.S. fighter pilot established when, when dealing with inferior equipment, fighting a superior, a superiorly equipped enemy, uh, how do you leverage what's essentially their weak point to your advantage? And it's just always looking for ways to leverage. And two things happen in that scenario. One is you're, you're constantly thinking that there's a secret sauce, something else that's going on that you need to be looking for, which is kind of true. Um, but you can also get faked out to, to being just reactive to the day to day and being consistent with what you need to be doing day in and day out. And that is if you're a business owner, either somebody on your sales team constantly reaching out to new business owners or you yourself doing prospecting. Uh, and then the second thing that ends up being true in that scenario is you can take your eye off the ball and be reactive like most other folks. Um, and that's and that's an advantage for a business like ours. We use an element of psychology in how we design this digital asset creation known as podcasting. And we leverage the, the human psychology and essentially what, what happens when people are in a fear-based posture. And now in today's lack of communication connected world, uh, we, we focus on giving them that you know, replicate if these walls could talk type of experience for the companies and be a fly on the wall and be that, you know, be that, that person at the bar that's seeing two people argue when you just, you kind of want to lean, you want to get up next to the bar stool so you can hear what they're talking about. Not so you can interfere with their conversation, but so you can relate to it. So it's being able to relate to your customers, relate to the, to the public and hear what they're saying and then provide them an opportunity to what I call Netflix out on, you know, Netflix out on you. Now that requires a lot of coordination. So that means we need to be honest with our people and let them know where we're at and essentially see if they're on board and willing to, to go back to back with us to make things happen. I love that. So that's a good transition for us here. You talked about making amazing content, uh, something that I will say hands down, you do an amazing job at your videos on LinkedIn is what I usually consume. And to me, creating good content that's eye catchy. You put something out on July 4th that I still, obviously I'm talking about it <laughs> in late August. So it really stuck with me and you covered some amazing things where you had no problem exactly put positioning your brand where you stood on your love of country. Uh, a lot of brands are afraid to do that where they just don't want to put it out there because uh, July 4th, let's face it, this was a unique July 4th for our country. Uh, everything going on in it besides COVID, we've got you know these uh, incredible riots and protests still going on in some cities. Portland, get your act together. Uh, I'm calling you out directly and I live by it. Uh, but you came out and, and claimed your love of country, which I just absolutely loved. And you talked about other business owners who were kind of just like, eh, they're not gonna do it. I think July 4th is a great time. Our country has gone through tough times. This pandemic is just like any other time in our history of tough times. Nothing like Pearl Harbor, nothing like what started World War I or even the Civil War. I mean, 2008 basically devastated us. In fact, the suicide rate was higher in 08 than we've seen even in 2020. So when you're talking about your content, your content does trigger kind of this thinking, this mechanism, this almost emotional effect. How do you, so when it comes, and that kind of transitions to Gary Vee, talking about you need to create content that people remember. How do you and your team come up with this content where you don't just put that cheesy crap up that goes out with, it's like a picture, a stock photo, obviously, and a logo and go here, this is what you should do. How do you and your team take the time to actually put the mental, like the mental, mental jujitsu to it. So people are like, crap, I remember this. Cause obviously it's working. It stuck in my head for over a month. It's a great question. So I appreciate that. That's a shout out to uh, the entire team here at Knucklehead Media Group where we put our money where our mouth is. We have veterans that work, that work with us. We have content writers that are prime Marines. Uh, I don't want to call everybody out by name, uh, but you're, you know, you're welcome to go to Neckohead Media Group, and we just click on the tab to meet the team. You can go check us out there. Uh, we've got some some great patriots, what I call them, folks that are civilians that that you know didn't necessarily serve in the military, but they served. Everybody's done their time, so to speak. Whenever you're, um, you know, whether you've served, you've served your family. You know, you and it's not uniquely American to to state that, you know, some of the some of the hardships that we're experiencing now 
are only viewed through the lens that we have here in the United States. Uh, whenever you're talking about some of those wars, there were coalition partners throughout the world that believe in the cause of freedom. They, they, they love their country also. It's just my belief that what we share in common as a, as a unique human uh, species or as, a, as mankind, what we are is we're, we're, we're essentially beings that want to be better tomorrow than what we are today. And when we fight like, find like-minded folks that believe the same way that we do in spite of things being bad right now, uh, what we do is we end up actually picking ourselves up. Uh, we just don't do it at Knucklehead where we talk down to people or letting them know that they should feel bad about themselves for not having a positive outlook. We, we lead with the fact that most of the time in your, in your worst moments, you were by yourself. But in your best moments, in your most euphoric, like incredible experience that you can think about, you were with somebody else. So what we aim to do is we take the stories of pain and suffering, of failure, of screw ups and, and that, that, uh, just that grit and gumption that exists in today's business world. And we activate and amplify the voice that, that works inside of your business. And we essentially systematize and storyboard what would be the best way for us to draw that out and provide it at scale to the marketplace so folks can actually hear a little bit more about what you have to say as opposed to just scroll past it, which is what happens probably 99 times out of 100 in, uh, in today's you know, digitally connected world. So to answer your question, we use, we use what people say and the words that they say and how they say it to design and orient uh, our, our content creation. I, I love it. I think uh, you're one of the creators I always think of that creates this kind of mind, mind bending, I guess I'll, I'll go with. Uh, I think of you, Rich Cardona, and uh, Brittany Leinhart on LinkedIn are some of my favorites, uh, all bets. Uh, your guys' content triggers like you know, you know, when you're on LinkedIn and folks who are at home, you're probably thinking the same thing. When you go on LinkedIn, you want to be able to engage, right? On Facebook, you usually, uh, you can take the high road, low road. I know the last 30 days I've been on a, I'm not posting anything political. It, if it talks about things, it'll be sports, which I absolutely love. And then just my kids, my family, and just positive things. That's just my way of kind of focusing on not being negative. But on LinkedIn, you want to engage, right? And some of that content, you'll just be like, bro, I don't want to, I don't want to comment. But your content, Rich's content, uh, Brittany's, uh, if we're gonna talk about other people, Jeremy Leonard is another great person, and of course, Shay Robottom. She makes amazing content that just entertains you when you watch it in high volume. So it's, it's good that you're doing that. So what advice do you have to folks out there that they're looking to get into this world of getting content? They, maybe they wanna contact you and they just don't know like what it takes. So kind of walk us through when somebody calls up your team and they're like, okay, my company has never done any kind of content like this. We've just, we have a Twitter account, we put out a tweet, we have a Facebook account, we put something out maybe once a week, but we don't do video, we don't have any of that. And I'm sure you run into this. <laughs> I know you do, because I know the folks on your team, they're all little rock stars and they do it well. So how does your team kind of take those people in and, and is it hand-holding or is it like, the way I was taught how to swim in a pool where my dad just picked me up and threw me in and said, figure it out. It's <laughs> a great question. So the, the easiest way to provide leverage for your digital media platform, and just to, to be real clear, each one of those platforms that you're talking about is rented space. They're owned by a, a huge company uh, in some way, shape or form, whether it's LinkedIn, Microsoft owns them, or if it's uh, Facebook, there's, uh, even Instagram and, and Twitter, they're, they're all separate entities, but they're all media agencies to a certain extent that you're renting space from. So you have the ability to view that as real estate. So what real estate do you own as a, as a company? And if the answer is my website, right, then that's great. That's your, your email. That's, that's fantastic too. Um, so as you optimize the awareness channels that you can rent, that you can leverage, that's, that's great. My, my, belief system is predicated and most of my experience is based off of leveraging a channel that you own. And in this, in this instance, it's a, it's a podcast. Uh, so you have a digital media asset that you can leverage in order to go and generate what I call a content engine for your, for your company. Uh, so what we do and everybody who's out there that listens to, uh, actually that consumes content, 
not all of them are primary auditory driven in terms of that's their primary uh, sensory sensor that they use in order to influence their buying decision. However, you're abandoning at least 33%, if not upwards of 40% of the marketplace for everything that your company is doing if you're abandoning this podcast channel. And it's not as simple as you talking into a microphone, recording your voice, and then repurposing it to be distributed uh, on social media, or excuse me, on, on these podcast channels. There's a little bit more to it than that. I gave a, a, a story a few minutes ago, Eric, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen it before, where you know, playing sports, if you're out there in the field and you see a confrontation taking place, for some reason you're drawn to it, you're magnetized. One of my favorite sports to watch is, is mixed martial arts. There's something about two people struggling against each other that's you almost can't look away. It's like you're driving past a, a car wreck. You want to be able, everything about logic and driving says, pay attention to the road. But yet you're in your human. There's something in you that wants you to like view the you know the wreck that just happened. Why why would content generation be any different? Why would your business be any different? There's pain. There's there's struggle and there's failure and there's 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 all of that that takes place. That if you could speak to that and provide an opportunity for folks out there who haven't heard you before, give them the opportunity to why I call Netflix out on you by listening to you talk about it, and then, oh, by the way, record some of it, then you can distribute it to get some, ch to get some, uh, not just attention, but then leverage that attention to potentially drive conversions. So it, it becomes more of a mathematic equation after a certain period of time. Yeah, I love that. So let's talk about that real fast. Let's talk about podcasting. Uh, <laughs> I was reading right. a recent review uh, or report, and yep. it came in uh, about more and more people, have, they're, they're seeing a spike in podcasts, as we've seen in the last, three months, uh, of course, uh, and now a new member, a new resident of the lovely state or Republic of Texas, Mr. Joe Rogan, uh, is now included in your resident count uh, as he took that huge contract with Spotify, which really has taken over the space in podcasting. It's so easy. Uh, I know for me, it's my new place to consume because I don't have to download anything. And that's my chief complaint with Apple was like it downloaded to your phone and ate up all of your space. Instead, you could go consume podcasts. They're right there and they're fabulous and they're always easy to get there. So <clears throat> always interesting. Uh, so with you seeing people coming into podcasting, are there like kind of what you're looking uh, looking at for like who's good? Is everybody good for podcasting? I guess is what I'm getting for. Because it seems there are a lot of people with podcasts and they're good, don't get me wrong. There's a, there's a butt ton of great content out there right now. But kind of when you're doing this and you don't have, you're like, Eric, I don't wanna answer this. Are there people that you're like, mm, podcasting might not be for you? Well, first of all, I think the most, it's a great question. Yeah. And you correct me if I'm wrong here because I get this question all the time. Let me know if you, you hear this. Right. How do I monetize my podcast? Amen. Have you ever Thank heard you. that before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that, I, that's probably what I meant to say is like, I think anybody can because we could all come on here and talk. I think the key ingredient is, is one, your first 30 days, you shouldn't be worried about monetizing it. It should be in your head, but it's not going to happen because there's a lot of numbers and you, you know what I'm talking about. And obviously you're the pro at this. I'm just doing it off of a show that is now going network bound, which is different than a podcast. Uh, but I mean, your, your show is great. The knucklehead podcast has always been one that you could go out and check my social. I've said this for years about you. Uh, but I mean, how do people think about that when you're like looking at them? You're like, great, you could have a podcast, but how do you monetize? Right. That's like the money and sponsors, because again, everybody for me seems to base it off Lewis Howes, JLD, or of course the great Joe Rogan, right? That the, everybody's like, how do we do this? What's, and I'm like, Joe's had sponsors for years, right? I mean, on it has been there with him. He's had kind of, if you've listened, he's kind of progressed through different companies. He's like the spokes model for, for sponsorship. How do you go about telling people, okay, you got to crawl before you can walk with sponsorship. It's cute that you want to be like Joe, but you're not going to get that Joe money right out the gate. Yeah. I think you just hit the nail right on the head. Um, most of the time, the question that people are asking is, is why would I need one? Why, why don't I just go to YouTube, record some videos and, uh, I have the same, I have this, the, 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 essentially I'm doing the same thing. I can strip away the audio and I, I've got myself a podcast. And the answer is you're absolutely right. Um, that, that is, that is absolutely 100% true. Awesome. My, yeah. my observation is if there is CDS 
and Walgreens directly across the street from each other. And there was a deliberate strategy that one of those companies decided to to use in order to say, all right, wherever there's a Walgreens, we're going to put a CVS right across the street. Or maybe Kroger or HEB here in Texas, those are two grocery store lights. Why, why, is, why is it that Kroger can be on one corner and HEB is right up the street? It's what you start running into is just because something works for one person in one area doesn't mean that it's going to work all all of the time uh, in every single instance. So that's why we leverage the people who are actually going to be consuming your content and what their patterns are because the past does inform the future to a certain extent. And we can leverage that past behavior to in, essentially to replicate these uh, this this process to where if somebody's going to find you and they're going to discover you and they discover that they're going to like you, how, at what, what would that, what would that look like? So why won't, why don't we just mimic what your previous folks who found you, why don't we just mimic what they've done in order to serve up on a, on a platter, what other people who are going to discover you are going to experience it. It's called the customer value journey in in marketing. And I just, at, people say it at nauseum, but we need to explain exactly what that, what that really means. That is looking at folks who don't know who you are and think, would they like to do business with me? And most of the time, people like to do business with people that they like, unless they run a boring business, yeah. which most business is pretty boring. So why not give them an alternative perspective on your boring business by having them, by having them understand a little bit more about who you are and what your business is doing and how you can help them? And that's really what a podcast is. It's an opportunity to create a conversation outside of the norm to really establish a relationship and also essentially facilitate some type of predictable pathway to conversion, which is what most people are really looking for. And that's where the timeline comes into play. And that's where sponsors really want access to. But that takes time to build. Yeah, I, I, and, I, and I imagine that that's not an overnight thing. I mean, we've learned that even here on To The Point. It's, you know, it was cute when we first started. We had a really big name on our show and they were like, hey, we'd love to sponsor you. And then it was the hard truth when you sit there. Yeah, you wanna be like, ooh, there's money. But then there was like, we had to have the sit down and this person is very well known, has an amazing reach, partners with some amazing folks. And I said, bro, we are less than 30 days in and my numbers may look good this week, but I'd rather you have like an honest look for a long run because it's just, you know, I don't know if next week it's going to fail and we're going to look bad. You're going to have invested money and failed. So I feel you on that. So let me ask you this before you get going. Wow, there's so much we could talk about. We definitely got to get you back on the show regularly because you are just, you're like a sponge, man. I'm just sitting there just learning so much. But I want to know, knowledge is power. I see books over your shoulder there. Uh, and I know we're all big, avid readers. However you consume it, Audible Podcasts, however. What will you say your top three books that you would recommend to any entrepreneur today that's learning? And I do this on purpose with you strong entrepreneurs. I want to hear what books in your head, top of mind, just I mean, you don't have to have be sponsored by them, but uh, who are your top three books? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> there's a really cliched answer that Think and Grow Rich yep. is a is a really good book, um, and I I believe one of the principles that uh, that he talks about in that book is finding the right partner. Uh, my I wouldn't be able to do anything that I'm doing at all in any way, shape, or form if I did not if I was not married to the woman that I was married to today. Uh, she is probably more responsible for the success that we have as an organization than any person probably even above me, I'd say in a lot of cases, just because that's she is that much of a rock star in what it is that she does. Uh, she's she's amazing. So I'm thankful for her. But Think and Grow Rich um, is a is a really good book. I I because I come from the military, I, I relate to a lot of the way that Jocko Willenick's uh, Extreme Ownership book uh, coupled with and he kind of dovetails some business consulting type stories, uh, really talks a lot about how type A dudes are ego fueled and how you can really kind of help to dismantle some of that ego whenever you're dealing with uh, type A hard chargers. And he does a really good job in that book, I believe, of illustrating those examples. And then uh, one of my favorite entrepreneurs that I've ever had a relationship with uh, is uh, a gentleman named Yin Young. He has, he's the CEO of Casaro Group out of Austin. He was on Shark Tank. Uh, great, great story. He sold that business. It was a how do you roll fast, uh, fast casual sushi place. Um, he sold that to a group of investors, and now he's running this uh, this investment business. He wrote a book called The Blind Grind. Um, phenomenal real world experiences from entrepreneurs who are willing to go out there and get their nose bloodied 
he says, don't ever fall in love with the businesses that you create um, because they could be out of business tomorrow. And the lessons that you have inside your brain will help you to go apply uh, what you've learned into a new vehicle so you can go out and become successful in whatever your next endeavor is. So the long-winded way of answering those questions. In those oh, it was books. awesome. Hey, you knew it. You didn't, you didn't falter. Some people are like, holy crap, that's a tough question. I'm like, well, we all, we're all avid readers. Read, reading is so, I mean, just knowing you as long as I have, I know that knowledge is power to all of us. And we know, I think that's one thing when you talk to successful entrepreneurs and tell me if I'm wrong, but almost every successful entrepreneur I know reads regularly. Like it's a priority to creatively take that time. And I know a lot of people, I mean, I was just talking to somebody. He's like, man, I gave up video games. I was like, wow, you're in your forties, proud of you. Uh, but you gave up video games. What'd you start doing? He's like, I heard, and I, I'm not meaning to toot my own horn, but he heard me talk about how I read a book a week. And I have been doing that for the past four years. And I love it. And I've learned a lot and it's actually helped our business by doing it. I have to laugh, one of my favorite books, and then we'll go, but one of my favorite books is Timothy Ferris's book about the four day work week, which up until March of 2020 was highly hated on by anybody I talked to. They're like, that's a horrible idea. Nobody will ever go to it. And now people are like remote working and getting your job done. And we talked about this with a guest earlier. And if you want to chip in on it, we would, but uh, there's a post on LinkedIn. You can go back and find it. Uh, if you're watching, I'll, I'll share it. It's Brittany Leinhardt. I had a great one. She talked about this concept of working hard. And people, some people wake up really early. Uh, you're talking about the great Jocko. And Jocko always takes those pictures of 4.37 in the morning. And I'm like, my eyes become bloodshot just seeing that. And I mean, I get up at 5.45 and that's early to me. Uh, but Jocko's already been up like saving the world, him and Mark Wahlberg together. You know, Mark Wahlberg before 6 a.m., has already worked out, read the Bible, and like sent off work emails. I mean, the two guys that work ethic has no nose bounds. But it's funny now that people work early in the morning, get like four or five hours before their kids get up, and then work again kind of later in the evening. Have you seen that in your business? Kind of like deciding, are you a more like in our house? And before you, before I continue, I want to say this: kudos to you naming your wife as one of those people that helps get your business as somebody whose spouse is also his business partner. And I know several other companies out there that their wives are their business partners. Shout out to all of us. Our wives truly do like hold this crap together. I don't know how they do it, but it's like they know how to juggle our personalities. And you know, there's sometimes my wife will sit there when I'll go bounce an idea off her head and she's like, nah, it's not that. And I'm like, it's a great <laughs> idea. And she's like, bro, no, 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 no. Don't you should hear yourself talk right now. Yeah. Here, here's what you just said to me. So <laughs> you should be I'll ashamed be of what clear. you're my saying. Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, exactly. So before you go, she, that my question she's is not a. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. All right. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Talk about your wife. It's important. You get kudos for this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, she's <laughs> she, she's not she's not a she's my life partner. She's not my business partner. Yeah. And and it was real clear to me for a long time. Or excuse me, it was not very clear to me for a long time what that really meant. Um, everything happens in seasons, yep. and so as your business grows and your business will attrition, you know, go backwards too. It, it's just a byproduct. If it's not going backwards, just give it some time. It will. And when that happens and when that resistance comes, the, the question then would be, how do you react? And when you're full of fear, when you're full of anxiety, when you're, when you're going through the, the emotions that typically accompany seeing a, uh, you know, running a business, you, your spouse is going to see you for who you are. And, um, that's why I'm thankful to have a partner like her. So awesome, great answer, great. great answer, great answer. So yeah, and finally, what I was talking about: people working at night. Uh, my wife is a late, late owl, a night owl. I am a, a early riser. Uh, are you seeing that in your businesses too? As more people kind of, I mean, you don't need to micromanage people, and you're not known for that. But you know, kind of seeing people working at their own pace, like early risers and the late owls. The work still gets done, but do you see this kind of continuing on, spreading throughout not just companies like ours, but throughout the workforce? Yeah, it's I'm there's a CIA principle called blowback, right? So if something's forced on somebody who doesn't want something, there may be some type of vacuum that gets filled in. So it was this work from home, working remote thing was kind of forced on people, so it created this vacuum of commercial available space and also, you know, folks that like to manage to the hour as opposed to the task. It created a gap in terms of that uh, that management philosophy. So um, maybe not necessarily completely related, but I, I do believe in that same type of principle. So I do believe that we're probably going to go back to some type of normal, like pre-COVID, 
just because it was forced, this, this change was forced. Um, however, uh, the more folks manage to the task as opposed to the hour, I do believe that they're going to get more uh, just by the amount of trust that they sow into their people. They're going to get inherently, they're going to be able to get more from those people because there's a team cause and a rising tide raises all ships. So the idea is help folks uh, see what work they can get done, when they can get work done, and how that helps you accomplish your goals. Sweet. I love that. And I want to thank you, bud, for joining us. So before you go, obviously, we're going to put all these links in here, but I love for this. This is the, this is my favorite part of the show where the guest gets to uh, shamelessly plug away. So plug away. Tell folks how they can get a hold of you and your amazing company. Check out what you're doing if you're a small business, medium-sized business, large business. You're the guy to go see for, your, you know, especially launching podcasts, getting your digital media, all those good things. Plug away. Well, fantastic, Eric. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, uh, first of all, for those of you who are watching, if you're not subscribed to, to The Point on YouTube, you, you need to. Uh, and if you're not following Eric on LinkedIn uh, and leveraging his network for, for connections, then go through Eric. Go, you go through and talk to him. Um, my, honestly, that's, that's, that's what I would tell folks. If you, if you felt like there was something that I said that resonated with you, then connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, Stephen colon, colon, just like the body parts, easiest thing, easiest way to remember how it's spelled. So colon, or you can go to Knucklehead Media Group and Knucklehead Media Group that's also on LinkedIn and on Twitter. You're, you can connect with uh, anybody from our staff there, uh, or you can go to knucklehead.agency, check out Meet, from the, Meet the Team, find out a little bit more about how we write, the way we write, how we produce, what we produce, and how to help uh, bring dead leads to life through podcasting, which if you're can if you could talk and you could communicate at your business, then you should be able to leverage that audience to actually be able to potentially either buy something from you or follow you and eventually uh, do business with you. Well, I want to thank you for your kind words uh, for telling people to subscribe and follow me on LinkedIn. Thank, thank you so much, my friend. Don't forget to hit the bell. Uh, uh, don't, don't forget to hit the bell. Yeah, don't. Oh, never forget the bell. I, I timed that perfect on that. By the way, that that. That was many takes to make sure that went down perfect. But anyways, but I want to thank you so much for joining us. I know everybody out there is grateful. Uh, I can see the comments here. Folks are very excited that you were on, have lots of questions. Remember, folks, if you're watching and you're watching this on replay, please scroll down into the notes. You'll see Stevens in there, especially if you're watching on YouTube. You'll be able to connect everywhere he said. We'll have those all in there. And obviously, you know, if you're on YouTube, you know we also put our links in so you can connect with us. But again, Steven, thank you so much, bud, for joining us. We'll have to get you back on real soon. And everybody else out there in TV land, we will be right back after these messages. Thank you for watching today's show. As always, if you'd like to be a guest or you know somebody that we should have on our show as a guest, feel free to email us at hello at tothepointtv.com. We look forward to hearing from you. And you can also email us if you have a complaint, want to give us kudos, high fives, or if you have an additional question for a guest, feel free to email us again at hello at tothepointtv.com. Our Twitter is up and running and it's for social good not yelling and screaming political or anything else crazy on our Twitter. So follow us on Twitter at to the point TV and we'll tweet back at you. And as always, we want you to check out our IG. We love Instagram. Our Instagram stories are up, they're buzzing and they're meant for you. We love our fans and followers and we want you to know who our guests are coming on and we want you to engage with us and we want to engage with you. So make sure you're following us at Instagram at to the point TV. Now, we love you on Facebook, and we want to make sure, because you're probably watching this on Facebook, like, why would I? You already follow us. But tell a friend that they can follow our show and never miss a live episode. As you know, here on Facebook, make sure you head, if you're not on Facebook watching this, then it's different, but our Facebook is to the point with Eric Mitchell. So make sure you follow us there so you always get notified when our show goes live at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Now, for the folks over on YouTube. Now, YouTube, we love our YouTube and our channel is growing and we love you there. Now, if you miss the live show at 12 p.m. Eastern, you can catch the premiere, which is re-recorded. <laughs> the premiere on YouTube goes down every day at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, and simply just go do that. So remember, with YouTube, what we want you to do is smash that like button, hit the subscribe button, and flick that bell, that's right, hit the bell, give that bell some bell love, 
and that way you know when we're on air and you can catch our latest episode. Check out our playlist. All of them broke down by the day and the guest and show so you can always stay up to date. Once again, on behalf of the entire team here at To The Point, I want to thank you for, again, tuning in and watching our show. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow on To The Point. As always, I am your host, Eric Mitchell. Be safe, be strong, be smart, and God bless America. Let's get to the point with Eric Mitchell. Let's get to the get to the point. Sit and enjoy. This is Eric Mitchell. He the host of the show. Get to the point. He is the voice. We needed this something more. This is a daily show that's known for politics and the sports. Ain't no limit to whatever you may see at this point. To celebrities, every key's beast in the joint. As a veteran, put them at ease and annoy. Every conversation can never be disappointed. Whether tragic. Or it's happy. Eric will cover whatever's happening. Whether it be your gymnast toe tapping. Talking about nearly any athlete. Not taking a back seat. You're never gonna get a past T. Everybody running from it, it's a stampede. But it's only like this man who took that knee. Mr. Mitchell's way too crafty. To